Our Gospel this morning is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard of him and came down and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue and looked up to heaven and he sighed. And he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace unto you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah tells us, Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. It's said when the Bible repeats something, it's because God considers the thing repeated to be very important. Fear not and similar phrases, phrases such as be not afraid and he did not give us a spirit of fear are repeated more than 300 times in the Bible. With more than 300 re repetitions, and some people count more than 365, fear not seems to be some pretty important advice. But telling people not to worry, to fear not, to fear not hasn't worked out so well for me. Most of them don't want to hear it. More often than not, I'm told, that's easy for you to say, but you just don't know what I'm going through. Most of us, I think, don't want to be told to fear not, because we believe our fears are too real to ignore. We don't know what tomorrow would bring. We could drop dead, get sick, lose our jobs, or lose our families. We have no idea what the morrow is going to bring. We have plenty to worry about, and it seems to us a good reason to worry about it. Jesus encouraged his disciples by pointing out, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And if you're not able to do so small a thing as that, why are you so anxious about all the rest? Easy to say, but difficult to follow. So what's the answer? Strangely enough, it's fear, a different kind of fear. The answer to how we manage to fear not is to fear the Lord our God. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The fear of God will help us to fear not. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. 
When the people demanded of God a king, Samuel told them, If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. I once read a novel and the author wrote, If you have a difficult and dangerous task to complete, the best person to send is a Christian. Because when a Christian acquires the fear of God, he doesn't seem to fear much else. As Jesus explains in Luke 12, speaking to his disciples, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who after he is killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Now let's look at the woman who comes to Jesus. She's a Syrophoenician, we're told, a foreigner, even lower on the totem pole than the despised Samaritans. She knows full well the attitude of the Jews, particularly the religious Jews, the priests and Pharisees. They would look down upon her as little more than a beast, less than human, and would likely have her beaten or thrown out of town for speaking to them. But she's desperate, her daughter's suffering, and she will do whatever is necessary to save her daughter. She's heard about Jesus and how he's healing the sick and casting out demons. No doubt she tells herself, my daughter has a demon, Jesus casts out demons. I will ask this Jesus to cast the demon out of my daughter, whatever the risk to me. In a sense, she's imitating a God a God she may not even know. If we understand the biblical story, then we understand that God has seen his children suffering and is willing to do anything to save them. He's even willing to come down to earth to enter the cesspit of fallen humanity and allow us to kill him. Whatever the risk, he will take it. The woman approaches Jesus and asks him, the text says, she's, says she begged him to drive the demon out of her daughter. She knows that any rabbi would be fully within his rights to have her beaten or expelled simply for speaking to him. But she approaches Jesus and speaks anyway. And Jesus replies, her gamble has paid off. Jesus listens and then he says, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now Jesus' reply sounds harsh to our modern ears. He's just implied that she's a dog. But in the context of first century Judaism, that's almost an embrace. And look at what Jesus didn't do. He didn't have, him, have her beaten, he didn't have her expelled, and he didn't say no. She goes even farther and talks to him again. And her reply is almost insolent. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs under the children's table. What a gutsy lady. Now, I don't know how much Jesus knew about this woman when she approached him. If you remember his encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well, he knew all about her whole life. So he may have had greater knowledge about her than we do, who, the, who this Syrophoenician woman was and how she would react before, he, before she asked him to free her daughter from the demon. Whatever the circumstances, after this Jesus said to her, for this statement you may go your way, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Jesus granted her healing for her daughter. Now, I think it's a pretty safe bet to say she was afraid when she went to Jesus. After all, Jesus was a rabbi, a holy man, and a healer. By law and custom, he shouldn't even talk to her, and she could be punished for talking to him. But she was more afraid for the life of her daughter. Her fear for her daughter over her, overcame her fear of the Jews. I think Jesus knew this. But Jesus is always teaching his disciples, just as he's always teaching us. 
So he played out this scene with a woman of low standing to drive home his message that the grace of God is for all people. God looks down on us and sees us as his beautiful children. It grieves him to see us suffer under the burden of sin, even if the burden is self-inflicted. Consider the lilies how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Not only are we fear God, Moses says we are to love him and serve him with all your heart and all your soul, all our hearts and all our souls. The Hebrew word translated as fear in English can also be translated as reverence, honor, respect, or awe. When we perceive God as he truly is, the creator of, and sustainer of everything that is, then we should quite naturally fear him, reverence him, and respect him. When we realize that this God of power and might also loves us and wants to protect us, then it's only right and proper that we love him back. Again, Jesus tells us, fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It pleases God to give us that which we need. We come to praise him, praise and worship him in response to his gifts. It's the natural result of the gifts received. Our gospel reading finishes with the words, And Jesus hard charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The people could not be silenced. They had to praise him. Just as we can't wait to tell our friends about something good that we find. I recently talked to a young guy. He'd been raised in a church. And he said to me, I believe in God. I just don't go to church. I find it boring. Now, I'll admit my servants may not, sermons may not be all that exciting. And sometimes the music might be a little off or the liturgy repetitive. But that simple statement reveals a fundamental under, misunderstanding of worship. Because worship isn't about the sermon or the songs or the liturgy. Worship isn't even there to inspire or entertain you. It isn't even about you or me. It's about God. It's about Jesus. C.S. Lewis wrote, But the most obvious fact about praise, whether of God or anything, strangely escaped me. I thought of it in terms of compliment, approval, or of giving honor. I had never noticed that all enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world rings with praise. Lovers pra praising their mistresses, readers their favorite poet, walkers praising the countryside, players praising their game, maybe a golf game. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses our enjoyment, but in some way completes our enjoyment. To fear God is to understand who and what God is. The difference between God and us is far, difference than the, far greater than the difference between us and the lowest living organism. Greater even than the difference between us and dead minerals. Knowing who God truly is should fill us with reverence, honor, respect, and awe. Our God is an awesome God. And the icing on the cake is that this awesome God loves us and he has made great and painful sacrifices to win our hearts. The only rational response to such a great and loving being is fear and love and praise. Let us pray. Lord God, we commit our way to you. Where you lead, we will follow. Where you take us, we cling to your assurance that you will never leave us nor forsake us. 
your love is faithful and perfect and with you perfect with your perfect love we cast out all fear we may feel afraid Lord but by the grace of Jesus our Savior we will not draw back amen <laughs>